two, one. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another episode of Delusions of Grandeur. I am one of your hosts uh, uh, for this uh, particular uh, double feature that uh, that I uh, had us do, uh, which often we end up doing, and uh, I decided to have us watch uh, two Larry Blameyer productions. Um, the first comes uh, uh, was filmed in 2001, um, and it's called The Lost Skeleton of Cadaver. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and it, it's a pretty wicked uh, 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 film, but, uh, but it's a film that was done in modern times that was fashioned after like a 1950s science fiction film. Um, it, it, or at least in the style of it. And uh, it's actually relatively decent. Uh, <laughs> so um, let, let us uh, get into the um, uh, s summary of this film. Um, IMDb says that um, a bat scientist and wife, a mad scientist and skeleton, two aliens and their escaped pet, are all searching for the elusive element atmospherium. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. um, um, on this first uh, uh, first film, The Skeleton of Cadabra, what was your first reaction to uh, uh, watching the first film? Well, I uh, watched it yesterday for the first time, and it was definitely a pretty interesting idea. Uh, <laughs> like, uh, uh, yeah, uh, we have uh, uh, several different uh, uh, concepts uh, mixed together here. Like, uh, we have sci fi elements like the aliens, then uh, these, uh, uh, then we have horror elements like this uh, uh, living skeleton and so on. And, the way it was all put together was uh, really cool and uh, also really funny, in my opinion. I enjoyed the movie a lot. <laughs> By the way, ladies and gentlemen, this is Boris, and he has um, he has journeyed with me uh, through thick and th uh, thin on some of uh, some of these many independent <laughs> films. He is from the anthology. Uh, Dark Zone 13, as well as another anthology of Joe Sherlock's. So, um, thank you for coming on the episode uh, uh, with uh, with me as we journey oh, yeah. <laughs> and see the uh, these uh, f films through different eyes. And you're uh, welcome. Thank you for <laughs> having me here. <laughs> definitely, man. Definitely. Um, so, <laughs> I first. Um, came across this film on. Um, I actually bought it, uh, the first one, um, I believe, um, back in two thousand one, or uh, uh, at least around when it came uh, it came out, and I bought it from oldies dot com, uh, even though it is not from oldies dot com, but I bought it from there, and I think I bought. The Lost Skeleton Returns again um, from uh, uh, from eBay uh, uh, later, but um, I ended up picking up The Lost Skeleton of Cadabra um, and, and uh, The Lost Skeleton Returns and uh, Dark and Stormy Night uh, uh, all like in relatively close amounts of time um, and. Uh, these films were directed by Larry Blameyer. Um, and uh, I, my first reaction to this uh, f film was like, oh my God. <laughs> um, <laughs> this, this skeleton, I mean, he's, he's just laying there and he's speaking to, uh, uh, to the, uh, this man and he's trying to command him to do, uh, do so, uh, something. Um, just the way his booing voice came out at him, and uh, and then of course 
uh, when you uh, see him trot along uh, behind the trees uh, after his his body has actually had atmospherium. <laughs> uh, the way he goes after the pe uh, people, it kind of reminds me of an older fi uh, film <coughs> that I remember wa watching called The Skull, except this one's a little bit more funny um, <laughs> and comical. And uh, uh, one thing you got to realize about Larry Blameyer's uh, uh, dialogue is he likes the double negative. He likes the... Um, uh, repetitive uh, uh, or the rewording of uh, of phrases. Um, yeah, uh, in the dialogue. Up, and, uh, uh, so there is a little bit of corniness in this <laughs> film when, uh, like when, uh, when when he when when it first starts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> and I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. I'm still getting over um, bronchitis. Oh, <laughs> oh are but, you okay? Uh, Paul Armstrong and Betty are driving, and uh, th th they're talking about science and scientists. And uh, the way that he rewords his phrases there is comical, to say the least. What do you think, <laughs> Boris? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, About that uh, beginning would... scene with Professor Armstrong and his wife. Uh, well, actually, when they uh, mentioned science, I was immediately reminded of the previous movie we discussed, uh, The Monster from Phantom Lake, where we also had this uh, uh, professor and his uh, female student who were also uh, traveling to the uh, main uh, location where the movie took place in order to do some science. So. Uh, that was my first thought, and uh, I remember you said we were going to compare the monster of Phantom Lake to this movie, so yeah, I was reminded of it quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, gl I'm glad, because uh, glad, it was in the vein of it, um, uh, uh, which um, there are many different films that um, uh, that um, and there were several filmmakers that I became aware of, um, and Larry Blamire was one of them, um, along with uh, Christopher R. Mim, and they were bringing back the 1950s. You know, it was it was kind of clever, and uh, Larry Blamire he he did uh, some w uh, work in trying to br bring back some of that that feel that uh, that. Uh, uh, air of mystery, the the, the theatricalness <laughs> of the 1950s. Well, I think he did a pretty good job at that. Uh, while I was watching the movie, I uh, actually had not uh, read uh, what year it was released in. And uh, when I saw what it looked like, I fully believed it was an old movie until I saw it was from 2001. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that this movie was filmed in Skeletorama? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, what we have here um, in this plot, uh, plot here is uh, we have uh, a scientist who's looking into um, uh, a phenomenon that has happened somewhere near um, his cabin that uh, that he's uh, somewhat rented. Uh, cause, um, they, they, they get up to this cabin and, uh, a, a meteorite falls. So, so um, uh, uh, um, he goes and investigates what fell or, or what, what might've fallen. And he finds, um, what appears to be, uh, a, a rock that, uh, cause uh, that's what, that's what Dr. Armstrong is, uh, 
is a specialist of rocks. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. And, and so, uh, so he finds out that it's actually atmospherium, which uh, apparently not only is he in the know-how uh, of it, but uh, so is the... Uh, apparently there's a legend of a uh, skeleton of Cadabra, um, uh, uh, which apparently there's a cave somewhere nearby um, where the skeleton lays. Uh, mm. so, uh, so we have that character. But we also have two other characters that are aliens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah I I, I like them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, they come to uh, they come to Earth looking. Uh, well, they weren't necessarily looking for it, but they crash landed on Earth at the same time of the meteorite, and uh, their ship became malfunctionable, and their mutant escaped. So not only are these aliens uh, involved in looking for this atmospherium. Uh, so is the lost skeleton of Cadabra, who has taken over the mind of another professor of some sort. And uh, they are, uh, it, it's kind of like they're, uh, they're all searching for the same thing. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, that was uh, pretty interesting. Like, uh, they were all searching for it for... Uh, different purposes and uh, it uh, all brings them together and creates some pretty funny situations. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. So what do you what do you think of uh, um, Professor Armstrong and his wife first of all? Well, uh, they were uh, pretty cool characters. I liked the actress playing his wife. She was uh, and her name probably is, still is uh, pretty beautiful. <laughs> her name is Faye Masterson, by the way. Oh, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, she was uh, pretty nice. <laughs> and, uh, and then, of course, we have the aliens Crowbar and Lattice. <laughs> yeah, they were the best. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, of course, we have a Dr. Roger Fleming, who was played by Brian Howe. Uh, yeah, he is the, the guy who wanted to bring... Um, uh, and he had someone uh, pretty interesting uh, who joined him very soon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, I was just looking at uh, some of the things that uh, um, Brian Howe has been uh, uh, been in. Uh, let's see. Uh, since that was around that time, let's see. He was in Return to Me. He was in Law and Order a couple of times. Um, oh wow! But um, after that, he was in touch by an angel a couple of times. He was in the majestic um, with um, Jim Carrey, I believe. Is that was that? Oh wow! I I didn't know that. Very interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, he 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 ended up go, uh, going on and do, uh, doing quite some things. Um, uh, he was in the pursuit of happiness uh, with Will Sm uh, Smith later on. So, uh, but uh, and oh. in in Annabelle as Mister Higgins. So. Oh. Well, who could imagine? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, but um, in any case, so um, we had him. Um, of course, then again, we we also had Animala. Uh, yes, yeah, she was. Uh, she was a pretty interesting one. <laughs> oh yeah, 
I think she was definitely a character. Um, so apparently Dr. Roger Fleming um, had um, somehow gotten a hold of the gun uh, the, uh, that um, Crowbar and Lattice brought with them. And he turned some animals of the forest into a creature called Animala. And it was a very well done performance by Jennifer Blair, who uh, eventually went on to become Larry Blaymeyer's wife in real life. So, yeah. Yeah. That was uh, probably... Well, at least to me personally, the funniest moment of the first movie when uh, they were all inside the house and uh, the aliens didn't know how to eat like humans. And uh, uh, I think it was Crowbar who told Lattice to just do what they do. But then uh, Animal started to eat like an animal. Uh, uh, and then they started to do the same. <laughs> that was really so, funny. Uh, what also was funny is uh, uh, their their first arrival at the cabin when they uh, when they found the doorway and they were like, "Well, why doesn't it just open? Come on, door, open!" <laughs> and and then they were getting frustrated when it wasn't opening. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then yeah. finally, it opened, and uh, when they were finally invited in, there, uh, 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 finally, Crowbar just uh, just walked in, uh, 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 you know, really fast, uh, like like they uh, they were waiting to uh, to get inside. <laughs> oh. yeah. the director did a pretty good job at uh, portraying. The aliens trying to act like humans, but uh, having some uh, pretty realistic obstacles. Like, uh, well, their he way was, start... the director wasn't uh, the aliens. Um, he was actually Paul um, throughout the whole thing. Uh, uh, oh, uh, oh, I know, but I mean, the way the whole thing about the aliens trying to act like humans, the way it was <laughs> written and performed, it was. Uh, uh, pretty good. I mean, uh, uh, I feel like uh, I feel like a lot of it was ad libbed. Like, uh, 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 like a lot of what they did, they did on their own. Uh, uh, they, uh, they uh, instead of the director having to do it, they created their uh, their characters on their own. I think Larry knew. Oh, wow. I think Larry knew that uh, that these two were very comical together. So he said, you know what? Just act like each other. Uh, and uh, oh, really? I feel like uh, like uh, that's what he did. He, he was like, okay, let's let's put the camera on. Now act like aliens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if there uh, were some aliens who uh, came to Earth and tried to act like humans, I could... Uh, <laughs> kind of imagine them facing the same struggles that uh, Crowbar and Lattice were facing in this movie. <laughs> <laughs> like, if their uh, whole lifestyle is completely different from ours, uh, you can kind of imagine them uh, uh, acting different from uh, us, no matter how hard they try, they would still... Uh, there would still be something that uh, we would find unusual. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, uh, what did you think about the mutant uh, um, that was uh, involved in the story? <laughs> oh, uh, I like the mutant. The, the costume was pretty well done, in my opinion. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it was also interesting when it uh, uh, apparently uh, fell in love with uh, Betty, which I think it might have been uh, inspired by Kim Kong. And, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it also somewhat reminded me again of the monster of Phantom Lake when uh, the monster fell in love with one of the human characters. Uh, yeah, it, 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 that, 
that that is similar. Um, but um, this one came first, believe it or not. Uh, the, the, um, this film, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, the Monster of Phantom Lake was from 2005, if I remember correctly. Oh, six. Oh, yeah. I think in the ending credits it said 2005, but then yes, the yes. The IMDb says 2006. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, we have the character of Roger Fleming, who has, uh, and you know what, Roger Fleming, uh, 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 Brian Howe is, is a good actor because, because right after the uh, after um, it, 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 there's a little funny part that I like um, where Paul Armstrong uh, says something like, "I wonder." Um, uh, as such and such, and then a little a little bit later, it goes to a screen where where Dr. Roger Fleming is sitting at his campfire, and he's like, "You know what? I also wonder." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there really uh, were a lot of funny dialogues in the movie, <laughs> but um, ultimately, he, uh, uh, Dr. Roger Fleming, um, he goes and goes to this cave of Cadabra, uh, which apparently is a, a legendary cave that uh, apparently something happened in there long ago. We don't know exactly what because we're, it's always re referenced because Dr. Paul Armstrong has said, well, uh, there is this curse, uh, supposedly, but I don't believe in that, you know? Uh, uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they they refer to what what happened uh, uh, or the events of the past, but they never exactly say what happened in the past. All we know is that there is some edge of danger going to this ca uh, uh, cavern of Cadabra, um, uh, where this skeleton is just laying, and suddenly uh, uh, the voice, uh, uh, this voice, is coming from the skeleton, and it is. Uh, demanding uh, th that he find this atmospherium uh, with a few uh, choice bad uh, bad wor wor words to uh, to uh, uh, and insults <laughs> uh, to, to get uh, get him some atmospherium so that he can uh, he and Roger Fleming can rule the world. <laughs> yeah. What do you think about uh, the skeleton itself? <laughs> well, uh, he was a pretty funny character, although I uh, kind of hoped that we would uh, see it uh, moving a bit uh, while talking, uh, but uh, maybe that uh, wasn't easy to portray on screen, but yeah, that would make the skeleton character uh, even better. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was uh, it was pretty funny. Like it uh, tries to be bossy and scary, but uh, at the same time, you can't help finding it funny. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, uh, ultimately, um, uh, like I said before. Roger Fleming's character, character, played by Brian Howell, he ultimately um, took and um, turned the forest animals that he found into a creature called Animala. And Animala is this sexy thing in black leotard, black clo clothing that seems to, to also be under the hypnotic guise of the skeleton. And so in so saying, she ultimately entices uh, Dr. Paul Armstrong into bringing the atmospherium that he is studying to uh, Roger Fleming and the aliens and the skeleton himself. <laughs> yeah, and then the 
the, the skeleton uh, also starts uh, speaking to Betty, uh, Paul's wife, and uh, she almost uh, takes uh, the atmosphere out as well. Yeah, she does. She almost takes uh, takes it to him uh, as well. Uh, so, not only do we uh, do we know that uh, that that the skeleton actually is able to uh, hypnotize people, but he's ap actually able to make people do things uh, that they don't want to. And, and it, I guess it depends on how strong the mind is. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah, good point. I wondered uh, why it, uh, why the skeleton would uh, uh, make contact to Animala or to Betty when it, if it could have uh, contacted Paul instead when Paul was the one who had the atmosphere when it would be the easiest for the skeleton to just have him deliver it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you, you make a good point. Uh, what did you think about Animala? <laughs> she was uh, she was one of the funniest characters in the movie. Like at the beginning, we don't see uh, what animals uh, it were that uh, uh, Doctor Roger Fleming uh, combined together with uh, this uh, gun left by the aliens in order to bring her to existence so she almost sometimes... seems to be cat-like in nature uh well yeah <laughs> uh, most of the time yes uh, she uh, she really uh, uh, added a lot of humor to the movie and uh, uh, she also was pretty good <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a kick out of every time she said, Rower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I swear to God, every t shirt that I saw, I saw after seeing this film, every, every time I saw a little cat that, uh, that said, Roar on it, uh, I swear, I said it like Rower. <laughs> You were reminded of her. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. So, uh, and, and, and to, to me, that uh, whenever I see R A W R, uh, th that's what I think of this movie. <laughs> if you see a shirt that says R A W R, I guarantee you, you will probably think of this movie too. <laughs> From that one, yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to me, uh, the funniest scenes with her were the one when she, uh, uh, when she started to eat like an animal at the table and made the aliens do the same. <laughs> and when she uh, licked the ranger's arm and his well, hand and he wondered he, what was going on. How about when he was about to leave and he looked down and there she was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> that one. Uh, I think the funniest scene with her in it uh, was when she came and danced for um, oh. a dance. Uh, what was it? The uh, what did she call it? The uh, the, uh, uh, what, the the something dance. <laughs> yeah, something. What was the word? I can't recall. Uh, oh God. Um, I'm I'm trying to recall. Was it the the jungle dance? No, was it? Uh, oh, uh, it was the rock dance. Uh, could be, could be. I... The uh, the uh, the rock dance. Uh, so, uh, so she, all she did was ju uh, uh, just dance a little bit a bit with the, whatever elevator music, and she, and, and then of course he started to dance. Which was kind of funky the way he was dancing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently he, dancing was. Uh... To me, that kind of reminds me a little bit of the Pied Piper of Hemlin, a little bit, um, where uh, um, there's an old story of a of a, of uh, a guy who could play the flute. And in order to uh, to entice the little children away from the town, 
he was able to play his flute, and they followed him. Oh, yeah, yeah. In this case, uh, Animala's dance was uh, her way to hypnotize the other person and get them to do what she wanted them, what she wanted them to do. Correct. Which, uh, yeah, which in turn was what uh, the skeleton wanted to be done. <laughs> how do you like how um, uh, how um, his wife Betty uh, portray uh, portrayed herself? Uh, um, she definitely seemed to be a little bit blonde ish, <laughs> <laughs> especially uh, at the moment when she couldn't find her husband. Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, to me personally, the funniest scene with her was when she uh, woke up uh, after passing out when. Uh, uh, Paul took the rock uh, from her hands and she passed out and when she woke up she couldn't remember anything. That was the funniest scene with her uh, to me personally. Uh, <laughs> like uh, uh, she couldn't remember anything and uh, uh, Paul said something like uh, until you uh, like I have to hide the rock because until you become yourself, uh, even you can't be trusted, or something along those lines. And uh, uh, it was funny when he said he put it in a drawer where even she couldn't find it. Uh, he said it was in the drawer, uh, it should actually make it pretty easy to find. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Because we know where it is now, <laughs> of course. <laughs> the audience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, of course, uh, many of these characters would state the obvious. Uh, uh, you know, um, of, co uh, of course, uh, there is no explanation needed. Uh, there was no real mystery uh, to, uh, to um, how... The uh, it was very predictable, uh, like the uh, like you s uh, said that the monster of Phantom Lake was, don't you think? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, in that one, like I said in our previous discussion, I found it uh, quite predictable that uh, the monster would turn out to be that guy. Uh, they were talking about uh, Michael Kaiser. It was uh, uh, it was uh, very easy to put together who the monster was. And in here, uh, do you, uh, do you find anything similar? Uh, let me think. Uh, well, I'm not sure what exactly are you referring to. <laughs> well, um, uh, the similarities to uh, to me between this uh, uh, this one and uh, Monster of Phantom Lake are the, the fact that they're both set in the uh, in like the fifties. Um, uh, if you noticed, uh, uh, the, prof the professor was talking about science just like uh, yeah yeah the other prof uh, uh, professor and yeah when they were laughing together in the vehicle that's when they kind of reminded me of the couple in Ma uh, monster from Fra phantom lake because they were laughing uh extensively together Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, when you said uh, something in this movie was predictable, like uh, in The Master of Phantom Lake, what were you referring to? I was referring to what happened to the skeleton. I mean, that was somewhat predictable to me. Oh, you mean that it would eventually be broken to pieces and that... Uh, that would be how it's destroyed. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it didn't come about right away, uh, uh, away, but once you realized what was uh, what was happening, 
and the fact that it, 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 he was trying to uh, destroy the monster, you, you could tell that it was going to happen. Uh, uh, you know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you could see it happening, just not as as uh, prevalent as it uh, as uh, the monster happened in uh, Phantom Lake. So, uh, but uh, I don't know. I mean, there was a lot going on um, in this mo uh, movie, and uh, uh, there were a lot of characters. Uh, the thing about having a lot of characters is you've got to be able to flesh them out to uh, enough to uh, so that they have roles uh, 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 that uh, they are to pl uh, play. And uh, do you think that, uh, do you think or feel like there were way too many characters in here? Or do you think that there were just enough? Well, in, uh, in this movie, I think it was fine. <laughs> but uh, in the second movie, I, uh, I struggled a bit to follow who is who, and they added uh, several new characters. Uh, and, uh, yeah, in that one it was a bit difficult, but in the first one I found it fine. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, I like, I, I, like the, uh, I like all the different characters that were here, and I think that there were enough to carry out the, the story without having too many involved. I mean, you had Ranger Brad... Who ended up being one of the first victims of the mutant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there um, was a, there was an interesting uh, reference to that scene in the second movie. Well, to me, I like the fact that there were two monsters. There was the uh, there was the one trying to control the world, and uh, there was the one that had escaped. You know, so. Yeah. Also, um, I believe the, the, uh, that in the second f uh, film, um, there were two monsters as well. So, uh, so. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Actually, I have to say it's uh, actually, pretty interesting. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, do you maybe know was it the same person who designed all the monsters in, uh, uh, in both movies? Uh, well, I noticed that um, in the second movie, and I'm not sure if it was the same in the first movie, but it, it, uh, let's see, I'm going to look, uh, look it up real qu uh, quick to see um, if in this particular movie, the looking at the creature design. Costume, music, other crew. Okay, so no. Um, in the second movie, um, which we will get uh, get to, I realized that there is a connection to uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Um, really? in, in the creature design. Uh, so we will get to that. Um. But oh, um, okay. in any case, uh, so um, what happens is um, after the atmospherium is brought to uh, the skeleton, the skeleton then becomes, um, uh, 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 then is able to move around and he's able to function a little bit mo more and he commands his henchmen being Anamala and the um, the Dr. Roger uh, Fleming yeah to uh, make the alien female lattice into his Ooh. skeleton uh, skeletal bride oh <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> <Poor> <laughs> Yeah, and it, uh, uh, from what I remember, it even managed to use its uh, psychic powers to freeze uh, the aliens in place at one point. Which, ladies and gentlemen, before I go on even further into the second uh, feature, um, 
spoiler alert, because we will probably spoil the shit out of both of these movies. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the first one we kind of already have. <laughs> yep. So, apologies for not saying that right away. But uh, uh, you you should know us by now. We're 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 gonna we're gonna do that because uh, we're 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 kind of doing a play by play to, uh, uh, play of uh, each of these uh, movies in our own uh, minds, and we're 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 talking things out. So, uh, mm -hmm. in any case, uh, um, so um, what did you think about the the fi uh, final scenes of this uh, 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 this movie? Uh, how it boiled down. To the fact that the uh, the one monster he was just so stupid that, uh, and uh, uh, in mind that he was not able to be controlled by the skeleton. <laughs> <laughs> well, the confrontation between the skeleton and the mutant was uh, pretty interesting, uh, uh, quite clever. To uh, 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 both will and say like each other to death. It was a uh, pretty good, although I eventually felt a little bit sorry for the mutant. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of felt sorry for the mutant a little bit too because uh, it wasn't. He wasn't. He didn't become hurtful until until he had to, you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, plus, it seemed like uh, Betty uh, actually had some kind of feelings for him, even though it, she called him ugly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he had feelings for her as well. <laughs> so, uh, um, I I liked the play on play uh, play words between the aliens uh, at, at, at times. Um, I, I liked uh, their char uh, characters, um, played by um, Andrew Parks and Susan McConnell. <laughs> what, yeah, you, what, their characters. what did you think about their characters? Uh, uh, the aliens, right? Yeah. Well, like I said before, they are probably my favorite characters in this movie because they uh, they really added uh, a lot of uh, a lot of fun and humor and uh, uh, all the moments when they were trying to act like humans but uh, weren't quite uh, able to do so. It was uh, all really funny. I liked them a lot. <laughs> So did I. Um, I, I. And what's interesting is Andrew Parks. He was uh, he was actually on Murder She Wrote on a couple of episodes back in the day. Um, oh, yeah. Um, and he was uh, in Donnie Brasco. Um, he was in the TV series Angel for a couple of episodes. Oh, cool. Guess. So. Um, it's real interesting uh, th uh, that um, much later he was in. Well, he's been in every single movie. Uh, well, except for um, the Meet the Mobsters movie. He was in every single one of his films. Uh, uh, so he's been part of the Larry Blamar troupe, uh, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, so Larry Blamer uh, seems to uh, have worked with uh, some quite famous actors. <laughs> yeah, um, there. I mean, it's not that he was famous. It, it, it's just he was a bit. Uh, he he was known as a bit character, and he was in some stuff. So he was in Heart to Heart in one episode. He was in Mash. I mean, I'm going to look I'll look at uh, Susan McConnell's character real quick. See what she, uh, what she was in. Let's see. She herself. Okay, so she was in um, the Lost Skeleton of Katavra. Um Okay, so she was in all of his 
for the most uh, most part too. And she was in um, a short film of the advent uh, 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 the adventures of Biffle and Schuster. Uh, oh God. Um, <laughs> That was a feature compilation of Biffle and Schuster comedy shorts. The Biffle murder case, Imitation of Wife, Schmoboat, and Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, those were short films that were created. Uh, uh, they were supposedly like a comedy te uh, a team that were kind of based on like characters like um, Abbott and Costello and uh, things of that nature. And um she was in something like that uh, uh, that but she's been part of the whole um larry blameyer troop to uh, do but she hasn't really been in much else she might have been in the rosa parks story but other than that uh she wasn't in much else which is interesting <laughs> yeah well i mean uh, uh, i'm pretty impressed by how many actors from Larry Blamire's movies uh, have apparently been in some uh, uh, much more famous movies and shows, as you mentioned. <laughs> well, <laughs> what's interesting is that um, Jennifer Blair was also I in uh, The Majestic as well. Um, that, that other guy wa uh, was, except she was just something... Uh, she was just... Oh, uh, uh, an extra kind of um, in there, in there. But but she also played Angela in Meet the Mobsters, which is the other film that I was telling you about. That, that um, is one of his films that we're not going to be covering next week. Oh, cool! I guess she was in an episode of Baywatch. So. Oh wow. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. All righty. Interesting well, indeed. <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, um, so what did you think about the uh, special effects of this movie? Did you um, enjoy the uh, special effects of this film? <laughs> I did, yeah. Well, maybe they weren't uh, very realistic but as the movie is supposed to look like something from the 50s or so it's uh, expectable for the effects to be like that and uh, they were actually pretty cool like uh, they had to portray the skeleton moving or the aliens clothes <laughs> changing or animala being brought uh, to existence and so on it was pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, th I i thought so um it was a well-rounded story uh, story and uh, I, I i enjoyed this one um i i like the dialogue i like the char uh, characters that uh, that were created and uh i, I like the quid pro quo be be between the two aliens uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, those are some of my favorite lines. Uh, uh, the uh, the fact that they know nothing of the um, human language, and yet the, uh, they or the way that they eat. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, so when Animala digs into her food, they, uh, so do they. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was really the funniest scene of the movie. Uh, to me, at least. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it, um, I enjoyed the special effects in this movie, too, uh, too. I mean, you couldn't really see the strings that were attached to the uh, skeleton that, and that you knew that, uh, that they were there. Uh, you know, it, it, it was a marionetted puppet uh, uh, that, to me, was, uh, was moved around rather well for what it was. Even though he was not entirely movable, uh, uh, the implants, the, uh, the, 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 the fact that he was there and the fact that um, they were able to move him around as much as they did um, and were able to, uh, to um, I guess, to me, all you have to do is suggest, be suggestive. Um, 
of you know all you have to do is suggest that it's evil and it will be evil you know <laughs> I, I, yeah. I am the evil skeleton of Gadabra, uh, even though I'm just sitting here not doing a darn thing but I am the I am going to take over the world you know uh, so <laughs> just yeah. to him speaking and describing the uh, the way he will do things you know, it is evil in itself, you know? I like the way you impersonate him. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, uh, well, I've, I've seen the movie a couple of t uh, times, uh, and I, uh, I've enjoyed it a couple of t uh, uh, times. Maybe not as much as the second one, but, uh, uh, but uh, in fact, the second one I've seen uh, twice now, uh, uh, which... We'll, we'll we'll get into it in a moment. Uh, so um, let's talk about music. What did you think about the music of this film? Well, it uh, 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 the style of it uh, also reminded me a bit of the monster of Phantom Lake. Like it was uh, uh, kind of like that. I would say. Uh, uh, pretty fitting the concept of the movie, like the whole thing, uh, 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 how they try to make it look like it's from the 50s or so. Uh, the music worked uh, pretty well for that, in my opinion. Okay. Um, uh, to, uh, to me, I, I liked the music uh, in here. Um, it, it, I mean, some of it seemed to be in fact, a lot of it seemed to be music that uh, I would have heard on an old radio show, um, to, to be honest, um, like something like the, the, uh, the Twilight Zone or uh, the, uh, the Outer Limits or uh, um, things of that nature. Um, uh, lights out everyone, you know, that, uh, that kind of thing, you know. Uh, <laughs> Um, see, I, I, I grew up with, um, uh, listening to some old, old ass radio programs, uh, Duffy's Tavern. Um, I mean, I was given the tape, uh, 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 like an old time radio tape thing where you had like a couple episodes. And then of course I got into listening to, uh, to some old radio programs cause I had an, an active imagination, um, no, when I was a kid and, uh, I still do, but um, it, it, even even more so when I was a kid. So to me, listening to these radio programs gave you a little bit more imagination. So listening to uh, to the music kind of reminded me of uh, listening to some of that organ music that uh, that uh, you you would have heard um, in a theatrical sense, you know. So. <laughs> Wake says, yeah, I, uh, I haven't been listening to those radio programs, so well, I wasn't have, reminded of that, but... I will have to get you into uh, some of the old shows that I used to uh, listen to, because uh, to, they're funny. I mean, when, you, when you're, you have nothing to do, especially during this COVID-19 crap, uh, that's... Uh, um, yeah. We have a lot of sitting down to do, uh, do. I'll have to get you at least into Lights Out, everyone. Uh, or Lights oh. Out, it's called. Um, um, the episodes that I, I'll have to I'll have to give you links to listen to. And you listen to them. And when we go on next week, you tell me about them. <laughs> They're hour-long shows. They're hour-long shows. So... <laughs> Well, I'll give it a try and see. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, so um, we talked about music. Um, let's see. Let me see if I can find out um, on the, the music uh, who was in charge of it. Uh, okay. um, looking at the cast here. All right, so the music department, the uh, composer, of, okay, so the music is actually, most of it is stock music, 
Uh, Ralph Carmichael, George S. Chase, uh, Richard DePage, Nicholas uh, Flagello, Roger Roger, and Francine, uh, Francis Trocade. Those are all stock footage com uh, composing. So uh, other than that, um, well, I guess um, for the title animation, uh, that was d done by Bill Br uh, Bryn Russell because uh, there there was a little bit of an animation thing uh, that was there. And I guess he did some of the animation for some of the other films that um, Larry Blamar did. So and oh. uh, some of the Adventures of Biffle and Schuster as well. So. Oh, cool. <laughs> but uh, in any case, um, what uh, what was your favorite scene out of this uh, film before we go on? Uh, in the first one, well, uh, uh, I think it would uh, uh, probably be uh, the scene when uh, uh, all the cat. Uh, wait, I'm not sure, maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, they were all there. When they were sitting at the table, and uh, uh, when uh, the aliens tried to imitate uh, the way humans eat their food, but then they ended up imitating Ganimala, and it turned out really funny. <laughs> that was uh, uh, probably my favorite and uh, okay. the funniest scene. <laughs> um. I would have to say that's one of my uh, favorites too. But uh, uh, although my one of my other favorites, uh, uh, and I have to say my favorite scenes are with Animala. So uh, to, uh, to <laughs> me, um, when she made uh, when she ma made uh, uh, Professor Armstrong dance, uh, uh, all of a sudden he got up and he was doing this funky dance, you know, and he. Uh, <laughs> Uh, to me, that was hilarious. That was comical. So <laughs> it was, yeah. <laughs> but um, in any case, uh, if there's nothing else on this film, uh, let's continue with the uh, second fil uh, film. Now, this film, um, this second film, uh, is a sequel to this feature. And he did a couple of features in between here, but I figured we'd go on about this one because it's in relation to it. And it's called hey. The Lost Skeleton Returns Again. Now, <laughs> I originally picked this up from Shelf Factory, but this also has a Blu-ray Blu um, copy that not too recently within the last year or so, uh, or so came out um uh because he uh because laird blamar did a kickstarter and uh he was very successful with it and uh was able to put a nice cool blue blu-ray edition um out there uh, there of the film uh and i do have it it's just in a bin somewhere west of me or east of me <laughs> Oh, um, I understand. Uh, sometimes it, it's uh, difficult to find some things when we have a lot. <laughs> oh yeah, um, especially me. I I have tons, and uh, I I I'd, uh, had to figure out which box it was in and uh, whatnot. And uh, I just didn't want to fully climb a mountain just to get to it, just at the moment. Yeah. I admit I kind of envy you for having such a huge movie collection. Well, uh, I had to earn a lot of it um, by wor uh, working. Uh, so uh, I hope that you uh, uh, yourself are able to, uh, to even with your, uh, uh, your disability that you have, uh, are able to find a job um, in this day and, a and age to uh, acquire your own collection. And uh, m maybe with uh, maybe in hopes that th there is a program that might be able to help you live on your own someday. You, uh, you never know. I mean, I I went through I went through a program because of my disability and having to live on my own too. So 
<laughs> oh, <laughs> well, uh, actually, my only disability is uh, I'm not able to breathe through my nose. I only breathe through my mouth, uh, but uh, that's all, actually. <laughs> but uh, in any case, um, uh, let's see. So, uh, last, uh, the last skeleton returns again was filmed in 2009 um and uh let's see let, uh, let me go back here to uh, to the to the page uh and let me read what imdb says about this uh, 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 film real quick so okay. so geranium 90 a little rock that made all the papers is buried deep within the Amazon, and everybody wants it, including crooked importer Hanscom Draley, slimy uh, uh, Gondro Slikes, cheap crook Carl Traeger, and evil doc, uh, Dr. Elemy Royne. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, um, in the beginning of this film, we have uh, what looks like a general um, who is speaking to Reet Pappen about... Um, uh, well, this uh, element, uh, right? Uh... Correct. And the only sci uh, the only other scientist that they know knows anything about rocks is Professor Armstrong himself, <laughs> played <laughs> by Larry Blameyer, who um, apparently once Reek go uh, goes to uh, uh, to meet up with Betty, finds out that he is uh, he the professor, Doctor Paul Armstrong has not been home in two years. Uh, yeah, uh, his wife hasn't heard even from him, hasn't even heard from him for two years, and uh, for uh, a major part of the movie, it's uh, a mystery what happened to him and why there is no word from him. <laughs> Correct. Mm -hmm. so what was your initial thoughts of this f uh, film? Tell me, uh, was this a first time watch for you? Uh, yeah, I watched it today <laughs> for the first time. And, and uh, uh, when, did, to... when did you watch the uh, previous film, by the way? Uh, ye yesterday. Okay, so these were both first time watches for you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well... In this movie, I have to admit, I uh, somewhat uh, struggled to uh, keep track of all the characters because we had uh, all the characters from the previous movie, even those who were killed were replaced by their uh, twin brothers. And we also had a bunch of new characters. And they were in multiple different teams, so looking for this element uh, so uh, there were moments when i was uh, a little lost uh, because in the story do you think that there were too many characters in this film well in, in the first one no but in this one uh, maybe a little bit uh, <laughs> but when i uh, watch the movie again it will probably be uh, clearer to me uh, but See, yeah, I, oh no. I, I as well uh, felt like there were a lot of characters in this film. Like maybe there might have been too mu uh, too many uh, involved. Maybe um, it, 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 to to me it felt like this film wa wasn't as you know placed together as as the uh, the previous film was this one seemed like it was slapped together in a sense <laughs> um, 
It's not that I want I want to hate it in any way, shape, or form. I absolutely love that Larry Blamar in his character did a total uh, opposite take on on his character, where he was happy go lucky in the first one. He was all doomsday here. <laughs> yeah, well. Uh, the movie was uh, uh, still pretty interesting. Uh, it, it was. It was. Because, uh, uh, first of all, we had the skeleton of Kadabra back. Oh, wait. No, no. Not a skeleton. It was uh, only a skull. skull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we were a little skull fucked in the skull duggery. <laughs> Oh, sorry. <laughs> nice one. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah. Um, so um, apparently, the skeleton returns again. The, uh, the, the, that's the title of this film. Well, the skeleton doesn't entirely return, does he? Uh, no, uh, only the skull returns, and uh, it's interesting, like in the first movie, it uh, uh, couldn't move at all without this element that was feral, and in the second one, uh, there is uh, only the skull, and it can uh, move on its own and even kill people. <laughs> <laughs> so, the skull... Um... Evidently, he tr uh, tries to. In fact, he does um, take over uh, the brother of Mr. Fleming, Mr. Roger Fleming, if I remember correctly. Um, it's his brother Peter, and uh, apparently, um, he ends up going to the Amazons for some uh, for this geranium ninety. Um, and, uh, Betty and this, uh, Reet Rap, uh, Reet Pappen. Pappen, uh, yeah. Played by Frank Dietz. Um, go, uh, they both end up going in search of, uh, Dr. Paul Armstrong. And, uh, when they find him, what do you think? Um, of that uh, that finding of where he was. Well, we see uh, we see Doctor Paul Armstrong uh, drinking and being uh, extremely depressed uh, because of something bad that happened to him, and it uh, uh, for a while after that it remains a mystery. <laughs> of, uh, it it remains a mystery what exactly it was that happened. Uh, but uh, then we find out that uh, it was originally him who discovered uh, this rock uh, geranium, and it was uh, it was not supposed to be called geranium originally, but it was supposed to be named after him. But uh, uh, a supposed friend of his uh, named Jerry ended up uh, stealing <laughs> it and uh, naming it after himself and presenting it as his own discovery which is uh, uh, what uh, uh, got Paul so depressed because uh, uh, he uh, put a lot of effort into finding it and uh, he lost it eventually in such a way. So it was pride that uh, that pretty much uh, uh, got the best of him, uh, pretty much. Pride in, uh, in uh, him ha having found it first and somebody else took the credit. <laughs> yeah, well, in a way, it's uh, understandable. Although, on the other hand, in my opinion, if uh, it meant so much to him, uh, he could have uh, uh, he could have tried to claim his rights and uh, prove to the public that it was him who discovered it, or. Uh, uh, at least, uh, uh, at least, let people know that uh, something had happened, and uh, uh, let them form their own opinion of who uh, who the original discoverer was. But no, he did uh, he did nothing to stand up for himself. Hmm. 
Well, um, we also have a character that is played by Kevin Quinn um, uh, of a, uh, he's a, a criminal uh, that evidently is trying to steal uh, uh, the, uh, the rock or find out where the rock is. Um, and uh, he is found out by a detective um, and his, and he goes by the name of Carl. Uh, there is a, oh. there is another character that is played by Daniel Roebuck uh, by the name of Gondrow Slykes, who seems to be an <laughs> oh. added character. Uh, yeah, that's the one who, uh, 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 the first victim of the skull, right? Uh, yeah, he was the first victim of the skull. <laughs> <laughs> Not the skeleton, the skull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, from what I remember, uh, uh, the skull uh, hit him in the head and killed him, and killed him right? It bonked him until death, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because he, he, he said, hey, quit bonking me. And then all of a sudden, he was dead. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's a pretty funny way to portray uh, a character's death in a movie like this. And shortly after that, uh, that, that's when we see the two characters of the aliens that were in the previous uh, 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 film, uh, uh, Crowbar and Lattice, played by Susan McConnell and Andrew Parks again. Um, and, of course, they use their, uh, their um, gun again to uh, become human again. And they join this this party of of this evil mad as as a scientist, um, uh, who uh, who is a female a male, uh, by the name of Doctor Elmy Royne, who was played by Trish Geiger or uh, Geiger, uh, however you want to say it, um, and uh, so you have two parties of people going into this Amazon trying to find the Valley of the Monsters in order to find this ancient rock called uh, that they call Geranium. Uh, yes. I, uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I'm sorry, what did you say? Geranium 90. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> so, um, what do you think about uh, either two of the parties? D uh, do you like the any of the characters in the more evil of the parties? Uh, well, uh, I found uh, uh, I did find the evil party a bit interesting because. Uh, I think it was this guy, Carl, who brought uh, Animala back with, uh, <coughs> uh, with uh, the gun of the aliens. Correct. And it was, yeah, it was interesting to see her uh, come back this way in Rower. the first movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In the first movie, actually, I found it a little sad when they turned her... Uh, back uh, to uh, the four animals and let uh, each go their own way, which uh, and made was, her no longer exist. Uh, and I kind of like the part uh, part where Carl turns uh, uh, turns uh, anima uh, uh, well turns the jungle animals into the because uh, 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 he's like, look, there are four jungle animals. Uh, uh, let me see what this gun does to uh, uh, does to them. And that's when Animal uh, 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 appears again. Yeah, and it's interesting because uh, those four animals probably weren't uh, the same uh, animals from the first movie, yet uh, Animala turned out exactly the same. That was, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, um, in fact, uh, when she was in the tree uh, in the one scene, uh, she actually 
uh, uh, showed which animals she was part a uh, part of, uh, it, it, which was kind of cool. Uh, I think some were birds. One was a snake, and uh, there was a, a a lion or a cheetah or something like that. And then uh, there was one more animal that because uh, she was like roar or rower. Uh, yes, you know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, there's a moment that I like in this uh, film, and I, th I think I'll say it now. It, it was actually one of my favorite scenes in here, in here um, where Animala uh, was uh, came across the the skull of the skeleton because evidently. It had just been left by a tree, um, and uh, she came ac across it, and, uh, she, and he was trying to control her, and he, he was he was like, "Pick me up," and and, and, she, uh, and she, she picked up a rock. And she, uh, he was like, oh, "Oh yeah, that was a rock. Put it down. Now pick me up." Picked up a stick. Yeah. No, that's a stick, stupid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she didn't end up picking now, him. Now, now, really, uh, now, now, really, pick me up. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, she picked up something, uh, a, a leaf. And he was like, "You know what? You're stupid." And uh, she was like, "Anamala, not so stupid." And then she just walked off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, like uh, maybe she actually did it on purpose. <laughs> maybe. But in any <laughs> case, there uh, the uh, the two parties were were interesting uh, uh, because they were uh, they were all heading towards the same place, and uh, in the Valley of the Monsters, there is uh, this leader called Chinfa. Uh, yeah, um, Queen uh... of the Cantaloupe people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that that's pretty funny. <laughs> um, and so, um, what do you think about that uh, that character? Well, she was uh, uh, she was pretty interesting. She and her male companion, whose name I couldn't memorize, it's a, uh, it's a very unusual name, and. Uh, and then, of course, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm not exactly sh sure. Hold on. It might have been. It might have been uh, uh, a guy with uh, uh, with a long name. Uh, Chipta. A Chinfa and uh, uh, her uh, her companion's name is the one I can't remember. <laughs> Sangramba or Hupto? Uh, 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 could be, could be. Or, I'm not could sure. it be bent vegetantis? Uh, uh, I think it was that one, yeah. Bent <laughs> vegetantis. Oh, and guess what? Um, I, I don't know who Chipta wa uh, was, but Paul Bunnell. I know Paul Bunnell. Um, he is a director... Uh, of his own uh, self of uh, a movie called That Little Monster and uh, a, a movie called uh, The Ghastly Love of Johnny X. Oh. I, I, I've interviewed him before, so I, I know of him. <laughs> oh, very cool. He's, he's also d uh, done s uh, some films in black and white. So... Huh. Nice. Well, uh, these characters were uh, pretty funny. I uh, uh, I was pretty amused by the whole cantaloupe thing. Like they had uh, uh, hats made of cantaloupes, and uh, from what I understood, their entire religion revolved around cantaloupes. <laughs> <laughs> so, the two monsters in here were called. The Gramanopidin, uh, or the Growl, uh, the Growlmanopidin, uh, and the Magra Clop. Uh, 
yeah, uh, uh, like I said before, I really liked the design of the monsters in both the first movie and this one. <laughs> <laughs> they were definitely unique, um, uh, both of them. Uh, uh, to be honest, uh, the creatures were at least original, and uh, the, uh, to me, they'd never been seen before. Um, I, I do like the I do like the Magriclop over the Growl Monophodon creature. Uh, to be honest, for some yeah. reason. <laughs> Yeah, the Magra Club was the one with uh, one big guy, right? Correct. Uh, <laughs> I like the look of it for some reason. And uh, I guess uh, uh, one mo a moment that I would like to uh, m mention is the, this Elemy Roin. She seems to be like a David Lin Livingston ki kind of a character, except in female uh, 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 in in female form, <laughs> uh, uh, where she's got the pit helmet, she uh, she looks like she's on a safari, you know. Uh, but she comes to uh, Chinfa, and um, uh, she comes to her uh, her asking for uh, for the rock, um, except she has. Um, the language of the double negative in trade to, uh, to get to it. <laughs> yeah, she uh, plays a lot with that and uh, confuses Chinfa with it and so on. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, Chinfa, shortly after that, uh, she does this little dance to bring the goddess down. And what, who do you think becomes the goddess? <laughs> Animala. <laughs> and what does Animala want to make the group do? Uh, well, uh, she was there collecting the geranium stones, and uh, then uh, what did she want to make them do? I, I can't recall now. One of the uh, items that she wanted them to do was to kiss a baby walrus. Uh, oh! <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But we didn't see that happening. <laughs> no, we did not, unfortunately. I would have wanted to see it. <laughs> I, I would have loved to have seen it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, that's when this movie went a little bit more crazier, uh, don't you think? <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, well, uh, one thing I found really interesting about it is that uh, uh, the first part of the movie is black and white, like the first uh, movie, then for a short moment it uh, uh, it gets it's, colored. It's, and, uh, it's, it's one, uh, once they start getting into the Valley of the Monsters, is oh, when it uh, color. Oh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that was uh, uh, pretty unique in my opinion. And then, of course, uh, that character, uh, what's his name? Reet Rappin, or Reet Pappin. He, uh, he ultimately uh, gets his demise. Uh, oh, yeah. But, but uh, he is one of the uh, victims of that other monster, uh, that first monster that we see. Uh, yeah. Like, and, be uh, and before he dies, he's like, at least I get to protect uh, you, uh, you Betty. Uh, <laughs> or, or something yeah, like that before I die. Yeah, that made his death a little sad. Like, uh, before that... Uh, he gave some hints of uh, having feelings for Betty, and when uh, Paul noticed, he reproached him for that and uh, announced uh, uh, there would be an encounter between them later about that, but uh, then uh, Reed Patton gets killed, so uh, that never happens. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So... 
in any case, uh, uh, but um, what happens after uh, after uh, they uh, after uh, what happens with uh, with the uh, in the last couple of scenes? Um, uh, uh, so uh, after Animala uh, uh, tries to tell the, uh, tell them w uh, uh, what they should do. What happens? <laughs> uh, well, uh, uh, a lot of things happened there. Like uh, there was this uh, little statue. Uh, what was it called? The Dump uh, of Anacrem, something like that. Uh, the, the Dump or Dop or Dope of Anacrem. Uh, yeah, something like that. I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce it correctly. Well, and I'm sorry if I didn't either, because I, I wasn't too sure on that uh, that notion either. But that stone or statue, uh, what happened to it? Uh, yeah, it gets uh, stolen by this uh, uh, scientist woman, uh, uh, Elami, right? That was her name. <laughs> Correct. Uh, it it gets stolen and it uh, uh, it's uh, moved from its place. Uh, it uh, awakens this monster called the uh, uh, Ma Magroclop, right? Yeah, the Magroclop. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, that's one of the things that happens, and also uh, there is this scene when. Uh, the aliens are with this guy Peter uh, Fleming, who uh, uh, who gets attacked by this plant and he gets killed there. That was an interesting part. Uh, part. I liked the pl uh, plants. It kind of looked like uh, something like uh, uh, the little shop of horrors plant, you know, uh, it, it, it kind of kind of uh, Venus flytrap looking thing I'm about. Uh. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think it uh, it attacked Lattice first, but uh, Peter saved her, and then he got killed. <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, he was able to clear his name, uh, at least, uh, uh, or his family name, at least, by uh, doing so, if I remember correctly. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then the aliens ended up singing this song. <laughs> Yeah, they they sung off key, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see, Peter Fleming. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that song. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, shortly after that, what happened? Uh, after that, uh, uh, they. Uh, or are you confused uh, at this moment? Uh, yeah, I am a little confused because a lot of things happened and I'm not sure in which order they happened. As I mentioned before, this is this was my first time watching the movie and I usually <laughs> uh, struggle to memorize all the details after uh, only one watching the uh, and uh, in this one, uh, really, a lot happened. So there was uh, a lot yeah. that was happening. Um, uh, so at the end here, um, it seems that Animala uh, actually had hold of the stones all along. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. She she took the stones only because they were shiny. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, uh, she, she ultimately ended up being a good character in in the end, because um, uh, uh, she uh, she waved at them and uh, just set the stones down. Um, but uh, what happened to the uh, uh, what happened to the Magroclop? Uh, uh, I think uh, I think they defeated him, didn't they? Yeah, they did defeat him, and. Uh, it was an interesting battle, to say the least. Uh, what do you think about what happened to the skeleton skull? 
<laughs> well, it was uh, pretty surprising. Like it uh, got uh, smashed uh, all of a sudden, completely unexpectedly. That was uh, yeah. I was a little uh, crushed at that moment. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I found that uh, pretty unexpected because. Uh, the skeleton was supposed to be the main villain, and he is the title character of the movie. So uh, his death was uh, pretty sudden and uh, uh, very quick, and uh, I really didn't see that coming. <laughs> Neither did I. Uh, I didn't see it entirely coming either, which is why I kind of, kind of find it funny uh, how um, Larry Blameyer was going to create a third uh film to, uh, a sequel to this uh, uh to this um um franchise uh and, but how would he be able to do that when the skull was entirely crushed you know yeah i, I honestly wonder too but i assume he would find a way <laughs> <laughs> yeah if Maybe uh, the... if it even happens I'm not sure if it'll ever happen. <laughs> but, Maybe uh, the third movie it would be only uh, the remaining bones put together by someone without a skull, and something would make them able to move and do stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? But um, what did you think about the special effects of this uh, of the film? We already know that uh, that. It feels like the, uh, the uh, this film didn't entirely. Uh, what is it? Uh, it, it was good. It, 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 it was it, the lines were good. The uh, the the dialogue was good uh, uh, to me. I, but there was something that just didn't entirely jive. Uh, you know, I mean, yes. all of the characters. It seemed like it was crowded. Uh, well, yeah, uh, like I said, it was the first time I watched the movie, <laughs> and as it had, uh, uh, it did have a lot of characters, so I uh, did struggle a bit to uh, follow the story with so many of them, but. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, the effects were uh, pretty good. Like I mentioned before, I uh, liked how uh, at first it's uh, uh, black and white, but then suddenly it uh, becomes uh, colored. That was unexpected, and it makes uh, the movie pretty unique, in my opinion. <laughs> and yeah, there were uh, other effects, uh, like... Uh, the skull flying and uh, attacking people and uh, the uh, uh, the costumes of the monsters were uh, pretty well done and pretty unique. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, we had uh, uh, this uh, gun brought by the aliens. Uh, I'm going to be honest, though, um, about Betty this time. I actually kind of liked her better as a blonde. I don't oh. know. I, I don't know if you noticed that her she had a, a hair change in color. Uh, yeah, yeah, I did notice that. I I wondered if there would be any reason why she had a different hair color in this movie, but uh, no, there wasn't any particular reason in the end, from what I understood, but. Uh, I actually liked uh, uh, liked her both hairstyles. Uh, she is a pretty good looking actress. <laughs> I actually liked her better as a blonde myself. Uh, uh, there was something about the hairstyle that I didn't like uh, for some reason. Maybe it was uh, because it looked like her hair was dyed, and, and I, I don't know if that uh, that has anything to do with uh, with how I perceive the, the way the film looks or anything like that. I felt the film was crowded. I felt like the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, I think those were the only two things that I would say that, that were, um, it's not that I didn't like the film in any re respect. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, but, um, it, it felt like it was overcrowded with characters uh, uh, like 
maybe one more one more character that wasn't needed. You know, yeah. it, like, it was one character less. May and maybe the, it, uh, there wouldn't be, it be as much um, trying to figure out who was was who, and I had trouble figuring out who was who in the beginning too, when I first saw oh, it. You did. Correct. So, uh, oh. so I had a similar reaction uh, when I uh, when I first saw it. Like, um, but uh, what I find interesting is I I I, I found that the first film. It was actually uh, distributed uh, through TriStar and Columbia Pictures, whereas oh, indeed. whereas this um, uh, feature, this was pu uh, put out and distributed through Shout Factory. Oh, but so, uh, but so was um, but so was Dark uh, Dark and Stormy Night, which is another one of his films. <laughs> so. <laughs> I thought it was interesting that um, that one was on that main uh, the, uh, the, that that's a pretty um, cool label to be under um, at the time, you know. Yeah, <laughs> to have it uh, have it uh, distributed under such a mainstream company. So, but. Um, in any case, um, what did you think of? Uh, 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 let's see, we went through special effects, didn't we? Uh, yes. <laughs> so, um, what did you think about the music that was involved uh, with this film? Uh, was it similar to the other one, or was it different? Uh, well, uh, from what yeah. I heard, although. Uh, uh, this time I uh, wasn't paying so much attention to the music, but from what I heard, I think it was pretty similar to the first one. Okay. Let's see uh, if I, I remember correctly. Let's see. Is this the... Okay, so this is the last skeleton return. So, um, creature, 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 creature. Uh, looking for where... Ah, so the special effects. Um, one of the monster painters was one of the Chioto brothers, Charles Chioto. Oh, um, oh cool. Uh, so he was behind some of the creature. Uh, uh. Sorry about that, folks. Sorry about that, folks. I apologize. Uh, we had a small little glitch. Uh, we're finishing up the uh, <laughs> uh, end of this uh, film. So I apologize, ladies and gen uh, gentlemen, for that small little um, disappearing act. <laughs> but uh, um, I was I was in the middle of uh, say, uh, saying something about the effects that um, um, Charles Chiodo. It was oh, yeah. 
Killer Clowns from Outer Space uh, unit. Um, that is the uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space connection that uh, that I mentioned oh. earlier. Um, oh, that, yeah. He he was uh, a character painter, a monster painter, uh, 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 someone who painted one of the monsters, or one or two of the monsters, I guess, uh, which was kind of cool. So, um, other than that, um, let's uh, talk about favorite scenes. <laughs> Well, uh, I think my favorite scene in this movie would be when uh, Chinfa was trying to summon the goddess and then Animala turned up <laughs> and uh, Chinfa thought uh, she was the cantaloupe goddess. That was really funny. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty comical. Um, I was thinking that... Um, uh, 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 when Animala was in the tree, uh, or no, I, I would have to say, uh, say my uh, my thing from earlier when uh, when she was uh was when Animala come, came across the skull when it was near the tree and, and oh, she, yeah. she was yeah. like Animala not so dumb and then walked off. <laughs> yeah, she kept picking up other things, <laughs> and yet Carl who came along. He was as dumb as rocks. So, uh, so, uh, 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 when he, he came along, he was just that easy to uh, control. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, did you have anything else that you wanted to add to either one of these two films uh, that uh, that that you might want to say? Uh, well, uh, I would like to say I. I really enjoyed both movies, although, yeah, with the second one, I uh, somewhat uh, struggled to follow so many <coughs> characters at once, but, uh, yeah, for some reason, I tend to have uh, that issue uh, when I'm watching uh, something for the first time, <laughs> if, well, it's, if it's so, if it has so many characters, and... Uh, uh, I, I so, as well. I as well at, at, at for a first time viewing uh, oh when I viewed this for the first time I uh, had a, a similar uh, uh, experience to this uh, uh, film I felt like the film was crowded just a little bit like maybe one character too many like like he had way too many people uh, that that wanted to be part of the film and he just couldn't couldn't say no to all of these Ooh. friends of his. <laughs> To uh, be in the film, and uh, to me, that uh, that kind of uh, brings it back to, uh, to the fact that you know when you're when you're making an independent fe uh, feature, uh, and you want to have so many people in your fe uh, feature uh, feature, uh, you're all kind of like friends. Uh, so when you're uh, putting it together, you're having fun while you're doing it, and I think that's that uh, that's the thing that counts. Uh, every single one of these characters, I think, were having fun, but I think they uh. were. Stretching it just a little bit in in this film, and Animala had more parts in here, uh, and I think we had a little bit too much of Chin uh, uh, Chinfa, but <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, aside though the fact that I somewhat struggled to follow the story of the second movie, I uh, actually really enjoyed both movies a lot, and I. Planning to watch them both <laughs> again. <laughs> I, I I'm I'm glad. Um, I, I'm glad that you enjoyed the, uh, them because they are enjoyable. Uh, it, it's yeah. just uh, that one is done several years apart uh, than the other one. So uh, so you you have these characters having a span of years on them uh, now. Uh, 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 but when they uh, it's some of the same characters put back together. Uh, so to uh, to me, seeing Animella again, that was pretty cool. Uh, uh, a scene that uh, she retur returned. I would have see when when I first wa uh, watched this second feature, I, I didn't remember Animella as much in the film. But I uh, now rewatching them again, I'm glad that I did because uh, I saw more of her uh, and 
more of her character. And uh, I enjoy I, I enjoy the films for Animala, to be honest. So. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so did I. So did I. She was really good. <laughs> but I and also I'm... enjoyed the alien characters, and uh, mm. uh, 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 their back and forth is often pretty uh, pretty funny, especially when, uh, when she gets together with Betty and she's like, "Oh, I've got this new recipe," you know, kind of th uh, kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, I think I remember one line that I liked of Bet uh, uh, Betty's uh, that was actually kind of sharp. Where uh, where she uh, where she said uh, you have no idea how dangerous sewing is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, uh, there was another interesting conversation between her and Paul when she said something like uh, uh, something like it uh, must be uh, it must be. Well, I can't repeat it word by word now, but when she said it must be difficult when someone uh, uh, takes your rock away from you, referring to what happened to Paul with his friend who stole the rock, uh, the, uh, I can't re repeat her words exactly now, but the way she said it, it sounded uh, kind of humorous. <laughs> yeah, it did uh, sound kind of humorous at the time. Uh, and uh, that's the thing. I mean, I mean Blay Meyer is known for his comedy as well as his uh, I I I um, uh, irreversible wordplay on wor words. He's actually got um, some books out on some of the language that he he uh, he has used. Um, oh wow! Yeah. Um, um, I th I thought it was interesting that uh, that uh, he um, it, it actually created you know uh, uh, almost like a dictionary of word uh, nonsensical words <laughs> 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 that, that he came up with. Uh, um, but uh, in any case, uh, um, uh, other than that, uh, is there anything else that uh, you you can think of uh, that we haven't mentioned? Uh, well, uh, I kind of wonder about uh, this uh, uh, little statue, uh, the uh, dump of uh, Anacrum, is that what it was called? Uh, I, ass uh, I assume that it was it, called the, uh, the dop or dulp or dope of, because uh, uh, they mentioned it a couple of times, but, uh, but it was ne uh, never act. Um, I don't think it was entirely worded out exactly what it was. Uh, uh, I get call, it. You know? uh, <laughs> but, uh, I mean, was that statue made specifically for this movie or did it uh, portray something else originally? I uh, really liked the design of it, actually. I don't know. It would be interesting to see, uh, see if uh, uh, there was something of its design out there. Uh, uh, just to uh, just to see or, or or whatnot if it if it was designed for any particular purpose it would be interesting uh, to, to see uh, see if maybe in uh, if maybe the statue uh, could be part of one of his campaigns later on um, as giving uh, giving it away because there is one or two more movies that he has not blu-ray a sized yet <laughs> oh <laughs> <laughs> or put on blu-ray uh, yet um he has put two um of his features onto blu-ray and a third is in the works <coughs> he put um he puts first he went with the lost skeleton uh, uh, skeleton returns again then he uh, went about and put his Trail of the Screaming Forehead out on Blu-ray. Um, and uh, recently he did a campaign on Kickstarter for Dark and Stormy Night. So Whoa. that is coming to Blu-ray. 
Um, and there are a couple of short films that he's putting bonus features on uh, the Blu-ray uh, with, uh, which were not on the DVDs. Um, and so I'm assuming that eventually he will be putting his Meeting the Mobsters and The Lost uh, Skeleton of Cadaver together. Uh, but uh, but if if I were him, I, I'd probably put Meet the Mobsters first, and then I'd put The Lost Skeleton of Cadaver, because he he wants to come up with the money for uh, for putting these Blu-rays out, and I think that would be a good marketing strategy for him to do if oh. he did so. So, but um, in any case, um, I think that's all the time uh, that we have for today, folks. Um, I think uh, we've talked about a lot of what uh, went on in either one of these films. And uh, I, I'm just going to look, uh, look real uh, quick uh, where these films were filmed at. If, if they're uh, okay. So they were filmed. Uh, well, this one was filmed in Arcadia, California. And Sable, oh. and Sable Ranch in Santa Clarita, California. And then um, the previous one. Uh, let's see. Uh, the previous film. Let's see what it, uh, it says, where, where it was filmed. Okay, so this one says it was filmed. Ah, oh, let's see. Okay, so this uh, says it was uh, filmed in Bronson Canyon, Griffith Park, at 4730 Crystal Springs Drive in Los Angeles, California, and Lake Arrowhead at San Ber uh, Bernard. Bernardino National Forest, California. Whoa, so, wow. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> in any case, I think that's all the time that we have for today, folks. So thank you for listening to our ramblings of the uh, either one of these two uh, uh, two films. I hope that yeah, you get a chance. To, I, I hope that you get a chance to check out either one of these two films. Now you can find them on DVD. Although th uh, this one's out of print, this one's not as out of print as the uh, this one is. And uh, this one was on Columbia TriStar, um, and uh, uh, this one was on Shout Factory. <laughs> so. I'm I'm glad that I own them um, on DVD. I'm glad that I own the Lost Skeleton of Return uh, 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 Returns again on um, Blue Blu-ray. I just couldn't find where I stuck my copy at the moment, but I hope to uh, to eventually unearth it and watch it again myself on its uh, uh, two or four K uh, restoration or whatever that uh, that they they normally end up put uh, putting these movies to. <laughs> so, in, in any case, yeah, uh, they're both really cool, and if you <laughs> can find them and check them out, uh, I recommend them as well. <laughs> definitely, man, definitely. So, thank you for joining me, um, Boris, on this film journey, and uh, hopefully, uh, let us know down in the comments uh, what you thought of the films if you've seen them. So, uh, uh Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and have a good afternoon. Yeah, thank you, Dave, for having me on the show, and uh, thank you, everyone, for, for listening. <laughs> Always a pleasure, man. Always a pleasure. Uh, just stay away from uh, skeletons, uh, why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you too. <laughs>